Film lovers rejoice. With Darktable 3.2.1, we have a new module called Negadoctor. It is specifically aimed for those of you who wish to scan your negatives and then work on those images in Darktable. And that's the subject of this video. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 68 of Understanding Darktable. As I said in the intro, we have a new module called Negadoctor, and it is designed to allow us to scan, and I use that term loosely, our negs. Now, why do I use that term loosely? Because you could either put those negs on a scanner, or you could photograph them with a DSLR slash mirrorless camera. And the way you might do that would be to either hold the neg up to a consistent light source, like just your computer monitor with a completely white background, or you might shoot with a flash through the neg in order to illuminate the neg. So there's a bunch of different ways of doing it. Uh, if you are working with 35mm negs, then you are probably going to need to use a macro lens if you want to get any decent resolution out of your digital capture. Um, and as I mentioned in episode 66, the new features for Darktable 3.2 video, I don't have any color negs in my collection. The small handful of negs that I do have are all black and white. Uh, so I asked if any of you were prepared to contribute some negs. Three of you did reach out. Uh, they were Ian McNabb, Graham from Scotland, whose surname I don't have, and Jack DeAngelis. So to those three guys, thank you so much for the negs that you've provided. Uh, I will try and at least use one neg from each of the three of you to give you all uh, a little bit of uh, spotlight. And so we're just going to have a, a dive in, and I'm going to try something a little bit different with this particular video. What we'll do is we'll look at the Negadoctor module, and I'll very quickly run through what each of the parameters is designed to do, and then we will go back and try processing some of these negs based on that explanation. So hopefully that works for everybody. Okay, so first up, I've got a neg here from Ian McNabb. Okay, so if we have a look at the Negadoctor module, what we've got, I'm just going to turn it on, but I'm not going to process the image. We start with the film stock. This drop-down allows us to choose between black and white and colour. You will notice that it defaults to colour, and down here we've got red component, green component, blue component sliders. If we change this drop down to black and white, these sliders will all disappear because we're not working with color information. We'll come back to that later on. We've then got this eyedropper or this color bar, which allows us to choose the color of the film base. Again, we'll come back to that. Dynamic range of the film. This allows us to set a maximum white point for our scan. The scanner exposure settings is essentially like a black point correction that allows us to set the black point as a process of allowing for the exposure value of whatever device was used to create this scan. I know it says scanner in the tooltip, but like I said, you may have photographed the neg over some other white light source. All right, so that's the film properties tab. Then we move on to the corrections tab where we have the ability to change the color cast for both the shadows and the highlights of our neg. And the reason for this, as I understand it from having watched Aurelian's video, is that the film that we were scanning, and, and here I'm going to refer to colour film, not so much black and white, the colour film might have been, let's say, tungsten-based film, 
right? Film that was designed for shooting indoors under tungsten lighting. Now, back in the film days, most of our lighting was tungsten. I'm talking about the old style light bulbs, right? Before everybody went to halogen lighting and fluorescent lighting, we mostly used tungsten lighting. And the color temperature of tungsten film was 3200K. But daylight, and, and particularly daylight balanced film, assumed 5400K or 5600K, depending on whose film stock you were buying. And as Aurelian said in his video, if you're scanning tungsten balanced film over a light source, which is daylight balanced, you know, 5400K, 5600K, then you are going to need to correct for that difference between the light source that was shining through the neg and the, I use the term loosely, white balance, more specifically the color temperature of the film that you're scanning. Make sense? So that's what these sliders are for. Again, we'll come back to this later. And then we move on to the print properties. And this is essentially where we get creative with once we've set all the parameters on the previous two tabs we then get creative with the way we want to interpret our processed negative which by this stage would be a positive okay i know a lot of that sounds a little bit like i haven't given you a whole lot of detail because it'll make more sense when we start developing the images uh just to specify before we move on the paper gloss specular highlights slider is essentially a compression control for the highlights the paper black is again a black point i won't say correction but because because this is more about the creative side of things it's not the purely technical setting up the way the scan is interpreted you know the, those first two tabs are more about the technical side and this third tab the print properties as i understand it is more about getting creative so that paper black allows us to change the black point the paper grade uh, aurelian referred to it as gamma and he said this defaults to a value of four and you should be able to take that value and subtract the value of Dmax from the Film Properties tab once this has been set, of course. And whatever number you end up with should be in between 2 and 3. Like I said, this will all make a bit more sense once we start processing an image. Uh, and then we've got the print exposure adjustment. And again, I'll come back to that once we start processing. Okay, so let's start with this particular black and white image as provided by Ian McNabb. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. So, as I said, we start off with this drop down. We've defaulted to color, but this is a black and white neg, so we might as well choose black and white. And I think I mentioned before that when we do that, these sliders for red component, green component, and blue component will disappear because we're not working with color information. So there we go, black and white. The sliders disappeared, as I said. What we want to do now is set a black point and a white point. Now, we can still use this eyedropper to work out the color of the film base. Now, my guess is that this black area at the top and the black strip at the bottom, they represent the color of the neg around the outside of the actual image. You know what it's like when you look at a piece of neg's film strip, you've got that, you know, color of the film base around the outside of where your actual image was exposed 
And my guess is that that's what we're seeing here with this black strip is the film stock outside of the part of the film that was exposed. So we click on the eyedropper and by default, Nega Doctor puts this bounding box which you know, fills up 99% of our image. But that's not what we want. We want to just select the film stock itself. So we can just click and drag over that area. And that has created a color swatch which is white. And it has automatically set a D-min, that's the minimum dynamic range of the film stock, value of, in this case, 78.63%. Next... We can turn that off and we want to then create a dynamic range maximum value. Now, again, we can do it one of two ways. We can either drag the slider for ourselves or we can use the eyedropper, which will, again, create this bounding box that takes up about 99% of our image. Now, I'm not 100% certain here, but my thinking is... We don't want this bounding box to be covering the bits of the unexposed film stock as we're taking this measurement. Now, I might be wrong on that, but my feeling is you'd want to just drag across the exposed part of the image. Now, that didn't actually change it, so maybe the module is smart enough to work that out. I don't know. Then we've got the scan exposure bias. This will correct the exposure of the scanner for all RGB channels. Obviously, that's more relevant when we're doing color stuff uh, before the inversion so that blacks are neither clipped or too pale. So again, we will turn on the eyedropper and... It has made no correction. Let's try narrowing that down to just the part of the image that's exposed. And you notice that it did add a mild boost and it did create much richer blacks for us. So we have now completed the first part of the process that is setting the film properties. Now we go to the corrections. Now, because we're working with black and white, I'm thinking that we don't really need to do anything here, as I understand it. If I click on this eyedropper, once again, it chooses you know 99% of our image. This is to correct for the shadows color cast. Again, I don't think we need to do this because it's black and white. If I choose an area that's mostly shadow, I do get settings that are slightly off from the default. So maybe it is still a valid process. Uh, and then we can do the same with the highlights. Choose some highlighted area. Once again, there are some slight corrections added to those values. So maybe it is valid to do this even for black and white. And now we can move on to the print properties. Now, sorry, I'm just going to turn that off. So moving on to the print properties, at this point, I kind of feel like there's really not a whole lot we need to do to this. That image is looking pretty damn good. Now, like I said, the paper gloss is a compression of the highlights. So if at this point your highlights are maybe looking like they're a little too push to the right hand side of the histogram and you need to tame them a little bit you could bring this down and as you can see it's just compressing the right hand side of the histogram i'm pretty comfortable with where that was the paper black i kind of feel like it doesn't really need any adjustment but let's go with the eyedropper again this has defaulted to including that part of the image which represents the unexposed film. And I feel like we don't want that to happen at this point. We really only want to be taking a measurement 
off the exposed part of the neg. So we do that and we've come up with 10%, okay, whatever. And again, I don't think we need to do anything more to this image. At this point, I would be calling that done and I would then be moving on to the crop and rotate tool to crop it down to what I wanted to use. In this instance, I would probably keep it square because there's not enough. This is subjective, but there's not enough of the rest of the landscape for me to crop this into any rectangular aspect ratio that would work for me. But again, like I said, it's subjective. It's just my point of view. So I'll keep it square. But what I might do is get a little bit creative here and I can't I can't get that well I can get the boat into the middle of the frame if I want to lose a whole bunch of the rest of what's in the frame but I'm kind of thinking if I was to set it so that the boat was on the left edge of the frame and the reflection was on the bottom edge of the frame that allows me to keep the majority of those trees I could maybe go a little further out like so. I'd probably crop it to there and call it done. That's me. Obviously, you know, you've, you're welcome to your own interpretation for how you would process this. But for a black and white image, using Negadoctor, that would be my approach. All right, let's move on to Jack DeAngelis's image and we'll see what we can do with a color image. Okay, so this is the image that Jack DeAngelis sent me, and obviously it is two consecutive negs from a film strip. And what I can see just by looking at this capture, which I think is in TIFF format, yeah, it was, um, is that there is these black areas across the top and bottom of this scan. Now, remember, we're looking at a neg. So when that's positive those areas are going to be bright white. So what I'm thinking is that is the light of whatever device was doing the scanning. So that might have been a flatbed scanner. It might have been that these negs were held up against a white computer monitor. I don't know. But whatever it was, that is going to be the white light source that was scanning this piece of film the lilac colored area or mauve area in the middle is obviously the color of our film stock and we've got our two exposed images now you would never i wouldn't imagine go and process this as a single image my thinking is you would create a duplicate through the duplicate manager and you would then crop the first one to just be the first image and then your second or your duplicate XMP file, you would crop for the second image. So I'm actually going to do that because it doesn't make sense to work on this as one massive image. So I'll go to crop and I'm going to go freehand and I'm just going to crop it down to something like that. And I can tell by the size of this image that, once again, this must have been medium format film. It's just massive. Uh, how big are we looking at here? 9,500 pixels by 3,800 pixels. So I'm guessing this is not 35 mil negs. Okay, so where do we start? We start with turning on Negadoctor. And these are the default values. So first up, we want to choose the color of the film base. Again, we'll turn this on and we will select part of the unexposed film stock from down the sides. Now we could use either side, it doesn't really matter. That's going to be consistent all across the entire film stock of where these negs came from. So. Our red component, green component, and blue component have been selected based on that area that we've chosen. We can now turn that eyedropper off. And what I'm noticing is that there is a very strong 
blue color cast to this image. One of two things is likely. This was shot in the blue hour, in other words, after the sun had gone down or just before the sun has come up. But I think the more likely explanation is that the film color temperature was tungsten and this was shot in daylight because tungsten film adds a lot more blue in order to compensate for the color temperature of tungsten lighting. So I'm guessing that that's what's happened here, that it was daylight shooting conditions, but tungsten balanced film or color, you know, color temperature of the film was for tungsten lighting. That's my guess. Okay, we want to select a D-max value, so we will just select, well, we hit the eyedropper, and what happens is this has gone all the way to a maximum of six, and the reason is because of this little spike on the right-hand side of the histogram, and that is those white pixels which represent the light source under which this scan was taken. We don't want to include those in our calculation. So I am just going to select from the exposed part of the negative. That gets us back to something a little bit more sensible. We can now turn that off. I don't think we need to make any scan exposure bias compensation here. It's looking okay other than the white balance. So let's move on to the corrections. Now, as I mentioned, the corrections tab allows us to put in offsets for the shadows and the highlights. And if I understand really incorrectly, this is so that we can compensate for any discrepancy between the color source of the hardware that created the scan. So whether that's the light of the flatbed scanner or a flash if it was a flash firing into the back of the neg or a white computer screen that the neg was held up against it all depends on the approach that you took and the color temperature of the film that's being scanned so what do we do we start with the eyedropper now by default this would have picked up about you know, like I said, 99% of the frame, it would have included the white pixels. That's not what we wanted. So I've redrawn this bounding box to only include the pixels inside the exposed part of the neg. Now, it's still not looking right, but we're not finished. We'll turn that off, and now we'll turn on the highlights white balance and as you can see, I've drawn an area across the sky. If we drew that across the entirety of the image, that might actually be even a little bit better. I still feel like the colors aren't right. It's looking a bit green in this part of the image. It's looking a little bit magenta-ish in this rock face, although that rock face is getting sunlight from off to camera right so maybe that is correct but the greens here that's looking a little bit worrisome okay so that's the color we've ended up with i'm not entirely convinced myself uh, but you know you could always go and use any one of the color correction type modules within Darktable to further tweak the color to suit your aesthetic so we will move on to the print properties. Now, as I said, paper gloss, highlight compression. And I think we need it here because it's looking like we're a little bit out of whack. Although, looking at that, it may be that the neg was a little bit overexposed. Papered black, I don't think we want to go too far. Actually, you know what, for the paper black, I'll go with the eyedropper and again, limit it only to those parts of the image which are the exposed neg. And that's not looking too bad, other than the color. Paper grade, we'll leave it where it is. Remembering that Aurelian said, 
that default value of four minus the value of our D max, which is two, should give us a value in between two and three. And right now we're looking at a value of roughly 2.01. Okay. In terms of print exposure adjustment, I don't think it needs it. The, uh, the histogram is looking pretty well distributed. I feel like that sky is quite bright. Although I do feel like we're losing the mountains in the background a little bit. So maybe, maybe we just want to dial that back a little bit here. I don't know. This is a tricky one. I have to confess. This is a tricky one. I am going to leave that image there for now. And we're just quickly going to have a look at one of the images that Graham sent in from Scotland. Okay, so this is one of the images that Graham sent me. Uh, these are all in JPEG format. They're not TIFF. That means we're working only with 8-bit data. So be it. And again, we've got an area up the top there, which I'm assuming represents the color of the film stock. So we will turn Negadoctor on. We will grab the eyedropper. It defaults to the whole image. We just want to choose some of that. And I'm going to choose as much of that as I can simply because if I turn that off, we can see that it's not consistent. There's a little bit of extra exposure on the edges of this neg, which leads me to think that this particular neg has actually been cut out of the film strip. And so it's not lying perfectly flat against whatever device did the scan. I'm guessing that the corners of the neg have lifted a little bit off the glass and hence why they are just a, exposed a little bit lighter than the central part of the neg. So let's turn that back on because I have chosen as wide a section of that as I can to get the color of the film base. I'm hoping we've got something accurate and looking at the image, I'm thinking, yeah, we're, we're pretty accurate in the interpretation of the color of the film base. Next, DMAX. We want to lighten that up a little bit. We don't want to clip our highlights though. We could go with an automatic calculation just by doing something like so. I think we were pretty much in the ballpark there. And in terms of the scan exposure bias, I think we probably do want to lighten that up just a little bit like so. And already that image is looking pretty good. Let's move on to the corrections. We will do a shadows color cast correction. And again, I'll exclude the unexposed parts of the film stock from the calculation. By doing that, turn that off, do the highlights correction. And again, we'll exclude the unexposed part of the film base. And that image is looking pretty good. In terms of the print properties, I don't think you really need to do a whole lot to that. That's looking pretty much like it's ready to go. So that, my friends, is a probably lengthier than you wanted run through of the Negadoctor module in Darktable 3.2.1. Obviously, there are lots of variables in the way that you capture the scan and the way that you then process it. A lot of it comes down to subjectivity. But in typical Aurelian fashion, you've been given all of the tools so that if you want to take a purely technical approach, you can. Have fun with that. Uh, our two-week road trip was absolutely, well, it was good, but it certainly wasn't a road trip through Croatia, which was what we were expecting to be doing in August of 2020. Um, I guess... The reason it didn't live up to, you know, what we were expecting was because it's the home state that I live in and I've traveled a lot of it and so is Kath. So it didn't really feel like we were going to places we'd never been before, even though we visited a couple of towns that we've not been to before. It's our country. It's our state. 
it didn't really feel like much of a holiday. We had a great time and I great got some great images out of it, but yeah. Whilst, oh, I should mention, whilst we were on that road trip, I borrowed from Tamron, I don't know if you'd be able to see that, it's their new 28 to 200, 2.8 to 5.6 zoom. And the reason I borrowed this particular lens was because I read about the specs of it and I immediately thought, that's got to be a really good travel lens. Like, you can do 99% of what you want to do with 28mm to 200mm. An f2.8 at the wide end at 28mm and f5.6 at the long end is better than you get with most kit lenses. And yeah, so honestly, for the two weeks we were on the road, I used that lens 99.5% of the time. There was one night where I went out to shoot some Astro stuff where 28mm just wasn't wide enough for what I was doing. And that was the only time in the two weeks that I put my 15mm Lauer uh, manual focus lens on the camera. For the whole of the rest of the trip, I just used that lens. I've got to say, and, and, and I'm, this is not product placement. I have not been given the lens to keep. I just borrowed it and I do have to send it back. I was really impressed. Really impressed with that lens. It's a great lens. Uh, if you haven't, check out my Instagram. I put up a whole bunch of images from the road trip. And like I said, with the exception of that one astro shot, you'll you'll recognize the shot. It's shot at nighttime with a tree in the middle and the Milky Way over the top. That's the only image from that road trip that was not shot on that 28 to 200 mil lens. Uh, so just for anyone who's interested, if you've been umming and ahhing about that lens, I absolutely give it two thumbs up. Really impressed with it. Uh, so thank you, Tamron, for the loan of that lens. Much appreciated. All right, people. I think that is going to do it for this episode. Um, yeah, questions, comments, feedback, sing out down below. And uh, I'll talk to you in the next one.